Anunso. Un chico. ¿Mm? It's a whole different thing when you have the love of an animal. <laughs> the love and trust of an animal. Right, Niso? Yep, she agrees. <laughs> What is up people, while uh, recording yesterday's video, I noticed one video in the sidebar, y'all would have also noticed if you looked at my screen, there was a video that said the ancient in Hindu roots of quantum physics, Archana Raghuram's full talk. So it's an interview with this lady. This is the lady, Archana Raghuram. She has a YouTube channel that once again confirms her theistic bias of how science implies God. And uh, she's got this channel called Temples, Books and Science. Wow, that is the most theistic name ever. Anyway, so uh, I let's watch the interview. Let's hear her talk about what the ancient Hindu roots of this are. We'll see what, what we get. In the meantime, let's open our grid of fallacies. All right, uh, we've got our grid. I'm sure we're gonna get a lot of fallacies here. All right, let's watch the video. So let's just get straight into it. My first um, query on uh, this uh, idea of quantum, quantum physics is actually physics. Why, you know, the, the um, meeting point between physics and Vedanta, yeah, physics being all about the material universe and Vedanta being about consciousness, how do they meet? Okay, that's an interesting question, Pailji. First of all, this distinction between material universe and consciousness is slowly breaking down in physics. This concept of objective material universe with space, time, planets and stars being independent ent entities governed by the laws of physics was introduced by Newton. My God, dude. Okay, let's correct that. Uh, there's no uh, breaking down of the line between consciousness and the material universe. First of all, they're not two dichotomies either way. Um, no one talks about consciousness also in the context of the universe. This idea that consciousness is an entity by itself in the context of the other things in the universe is a Hindu idea. And nobody really talks about that except people who are obsessed with uh, Vedanta and uh, uh, they will cite people like German physicists to support their point. Now, this idea of material universe, objective universe, as opposed to what else? A spiritual universe? I mean, the opposite of material that I've seen in many places is spiritual. So what, there is a spiritual universe? What evidence or what reason can you give me that that does exist? Or that anything other than the material universe exists? Now, you can give me arguments like your mind, uh, your thoughts, they don't exist in the material universe. I'm not arguing that. I'm arguing that something other than the material universe, some other kind of universe exists. It's a point that needs to be substantiated. Mind and the thoughts are, we have evidential basis for all those things. Those are electrochemical reactions happening inside our brain. Modern neuroscience has more than enough evidence to show you this. But still, there are people like these who will use terms like material universe. Don't even say that. Just say universe. There's only one kind of universe. No, universe functions independently based on these laws of nature. And there is no need for consciousness. And there's no need for God either. This was the initial view of physics, initial view of science. And as we understood, delve deeper into science, this view slowly started breaking down. That's not true at all. She's saying classical physics of Newton had this view. But there's no modern physics or any modern physicists who've invoked or who've started using an idea of God to base their theories on. There's no such thing. What is she saying? Someone please. Oh my God, this is frustrating me. Even this view of reality which Newton presented, this classical physics view of reality started to be questionable. First of all, if you look at classic physics, there are many things in classical physics which point to the existence of an intelligence and intention behind the creation. Yeah, like what? Take for example, let's begin with Big Bang. That's Big Bang, the idea came in the 1900s, well after Newton. Let's begin with Big Bang. That's how our universe began, science claims. 
And when you think of Big Bang, you think of it as an explosion, a, a chaotic event. Suddenly an explosion happened. The Big Bang is not an explosion. There was nothing to explode. There was no atmosphere or oxygen to burn something in that explosion. The Big Bang is a rapid expansion of space-time. And that's how all the galaxies, the stars, all of them were created. But if you look at Big Bang, it's been fine-tuned for the creation oh of the God. universe. If Big Bang was 0 0.000... What do you mean by Big Bang was 0.01% more powerful? I've heard the fine-tuning argument before and it talks about if the constants of the universe are a little different, then they could not exist. They would not exist. But that's an, again, that's like a variation of the design argument. That's like looking at a pothole with some part, with a, with some puddle of rainwater and saying that, hey, if that pothole that's that's so perfectly there on the road. Look at it. The shape of that pothole perfectly wraps around the puddle of water. Man, that pothole seems to be designed. That's so stupid. It's because of the shape of the pothole that the water took that shape. In the same way, it's because of this these constants being this way that life in this form occurred in this universe. One person more forceful, more strong. Oh wait, universe would not exist. See, there's also another thing, okay? There's a bias. The bias is because we can observe the universe. We can talk about it. We can talk about the existence of the universe. If we didn't exist, if there existed some other kind of universe in which there was no one to observe and talk about it, can anyone say that that universe did not exist? I mean, there is no one to observe it. So did it not exist? Did it or did it not? This is all philosophy again, but uh, that's a problem with this argument. Longer, there would be no stars, no planets, and no life on Earth. And let's look at the, per, uh, the first... Yeah, you can say that because you do exist. You can observe the universe. ...set of forces that were created, the four fundamental forces of physics that was created immediately after the Big Bang. And they also seem to be fine-tuned for life. For example, if the, these fundamental forces electromagnetic force, gravity, strong nuclear force and weak nu nuclear force vary even by 2%. There would be no stars, no planets. And if it... My God, dude. See, we don't live in a universe where they do vary by 2%, whatever she said. See, in such a universe, you're making an assumption that the laws of physics would be exactly the same, but the constants of those forces would change a little bit. How can you make an assumption about that universe when you don't know anything about that universe? There's no one in that universe to, to observe it. And given that situation, how can you say it doesn't exist? And if, it, if they vary by 0.5%, there would be no life on them. You know how improbable the occurrence of life is even in this universe? Like 99 point whatever, 99999 whatever percent of the universe cannot support life. Life can only, the only place we know of that where life exists is the earth. Of course, there could be other planets out there with life. But again, the vast majority of the universe is empty. How, how absolutely inefficient are the constants which were apparently so fine-tuned if life barely exists in that universe. And then uh, how the universe began with a very low entropy. Entropy is another concept in physics, which talks about uh, the orderliness of anything. Entropy measures the orderliness of anything. And when you look at something which is very well ordered, what would you think? It has been arranged by someone, right? Because chaos is the natural state of things. Things tend to get messy. That's what... No, uh, entropy uh, increases with time. And so the further back you go in time, entropy decreases. So if you look at uh, the Big Bang, that's like an extremely low entropy state of the universe. So it depends on what point in time you're asking this question from. Entropy measures. And uh, what they found is at the beginning, when the universe began, the entropy was so Researcher, low. Was so low. It is like that kind of entropy is possible only, it is not it almost close to impossible to ha happen naturally. It's only possible if somebody has arranged it that way. Really? Really? 
that's the only possibility you can think of. I would much rather say that I don't know what happened at that point than invoke a certain someone who arranged it that way. That gives me a lot more questions than answers. You know, the po probability that a low entropy universe, the universe began with such a low entropy, is one in a trillion, billion, billion, trillion. It is close to an important. How did you arrive at that probability? Huh? Probability. So this is also boggling the scientists because our universe is looking more like a fine-tuned machine, like a rocket or a watch or a sophisticated machine where every parameter is fine-tuned. Even small variations in these parameters will cause the collapse of the universe. So this kind of fine-tuning is totally unexplainable by mere chance, by mere quirk of, you know, by, by chance this whole thing happened. It's unexplainable. That Chance is actually a better explanation than someone did it. That's why many scientists are now proposing this theory called anthropic principle. Or anthropic principle states that there's a purpose for this universe. Oh my god, that's not what anthropic principle states. Anthropic principle is, is basically humans inherently have a bias. We have bias since we see uni the universe from a human centric perspective. We have a tendency to believe that things in the universe have been designed to make human life possible. Such a perspective exists only because human life exists in the, in this universe. It's again like that design argument I talked about earlier in the video. It's easy to think that the ozone layer exists to protect us when in fact we evolved on a planet that has an ozone layer. So we didn't need to evolve ways to protect us from UV radiation because the ozone layer does that for us. But it's easy to think that ozone layer was is there for our protection, right? That is the anthropic principle. And it's not really something that has been proposed by scientists or something. It's a philosophical idea. Philosophers think about this often. It's not part of physics at all. Universe is not a random occurrence, but there is a specific purpose for it. And the purpose is to create life. So this is what physicists are uh, saying. Not what? philosophers, not people of religion. No, it's not what physicists are saying. It's what philosophers are saying. Religion, but physicists, that there is a purpose to the universe and the purpose to the purpose of the universe is to create life. And now you just see how closely it aligns with our karma theory. Let's actually mark some fallacies that we got so far. First thing would be, there are many extraordinary claims being made and no evidence is being presented only misinformation and she's rationalizing things from her point of view she's confirming her own biases where's confirmation bias i think she is appealing to authority in a way she's saying that physicists are saying this and so this is the right way to think um what else that's about it i think what does karma theory says why was the universe created it is for all living beings to exhaust their karma so without karma theory it seems without living beings there is no purpose to the universe and now physics also is coming to that conclusion and more than guys physics is not coming to that conclusion uh, she is misrepresenting what physics is coming to so i will mark a straw man also here uh, after newton there were very great many great discoveries in physics the second big breakthrough in physics was einstein's theory of relativity which kind of uh, crush this notion of objective static universe. You know, uh, when, when you travel at the speed of light, time itself slows down and space shrinks in size. So this kind of uh, what the universe is, if you say what is the size of this laptop which I'm looking at, it will vary. It has no specific value. It would depend on my perspective. If I'm traveling at a certain speed, this laptop will be smaller. Okay, now how does all this relate to Vedanta or Hinduism? And if I'm starting, this laptop will be larger. And it's not an illusion. That's the way universe is. Things are smaller and bigger depending on the perspective of the observer. Okay, Hinduism. So with Einstein's relativity itself, consciousness and observer slowly began to show its face. Wait, where, where is consciousness in what you said? Although Einstein never said a conscious observer is required, mm. it became evident 
that the universe, the shape of the universe is determined by from where you're looking at it, the perspective of an observer. And then quantum physics happened and it brought consciousness right to the center of physics. What quantum physics showed was that until you observe... Nowhere in quantum physics, they talk about consciousness. She's mentioning something about observing. Yeah, they talk about that. How is that consciousness? Of anything, it does not exist. Particles at an atomic level, at a particle level, electron, proton level, they do not exist until they are observed. No, their position remains undetermined until observation. They behave differently until observed. That's what it says. Not that they don't exist. So until they are observed, they are just some ephemeral wave. They don't. We don't even know what form they are in until we observe them. And our act of observation brings particles into existence. And how much more? No! Observation is not what brings them into existence. Oh my God. The amount of misrepresenting that has gone on so far is unbelievable. So particles don't exist because we observe them. Particles exist whether or not we observe them. But observation changes the behavior of the particles. Central can consciousness become to physics than this? So definitely there is a lot of relationship between physics, which once upon a time dealt with only the material world and, and consciousness, which we all thought was only the forte of Vedanta, but it's now very much be becoming a part of physics. Okay, uh, you know what? That's the end of this chapter. There is another chapter called Quantum Physics and Vedanta. We just watched the chapter on material universe versus consciousness. Uh, there's a chapter on quantum physics versus Vedanta, but I think this video has already gotten really long. I will react to this if you guys really want me to. But until then, let this be a video by itself. I'll see you in the next one.